So I'm going to go a little renegade here and talk about nutation before I talk about the Euler angles. Is that allowed? No, but I'm doing it anyway. All right, so I want to review a little bit. Um, first, if we go back to uh, last week, sometime last week, we worked out the precession of a top, um, and we did this even before we had the Euler equations for rotation, and we did it, uh, we made some assumptions, um, which I'll mention in a moment, uh, mostly about sizes of omegas. We made some assumptions. Uh, but just to review, all right, so if we had the ground here and we had a top, right, and so it's a disk on some lightweight thing, just so we knew the moment of inertia. And the displacement from the pivot point, so the idea is this is fixed in this frictional torques, right? So the displacement from the pivot point to there, we called R, and then the force of gravity was that way. So if you work out the torque um, as a result of gravity, the torque due to gravity is into the page. And then we also started with omega entirely along this axis, um, which meant that L, it's a principal axis, right? So L was also entirely along that axis. And we had torque is equal to dl dt, right? That's just, that's just what torque is, right? Um, and in this case, if you look at it, you'll notice the torque is perpendicular to omega, um, right? Because omega is in the xz plane. I guess I should define my axes if I'm going to say stuff like that. It's in the XZ plane, and use your right hand to make sure Y is into the page here. Omega is in the XZ plane, and R and FG are in the XZ plane, and since torque is uh, perpendicular to R and FG, torque is entirely perpendicular to the XZ plane, right? Um, so what that means is, therefore, we will conclude that the magnitude of L can't change, right? Because the torque, right, so L is parallel to omega, and the torque is perpendicular. And when you have a vector and that vector dot, right, the rate of change of that vector are perpendicular, it doesn't change the magnitude, it just changes the direction, right? And so you would say, ah, okay, and this is the case you have for circular motion. So therefore, uh, circular motion, right, circular motion of L. Um, however, we've made this this actually doesn't logically follow it turns out and the reason is is this l can't change is only instantaneously true right it's true right now instantaneous whatever pretend i wrote instantaneously um it's true right now but is it true forever so let me give you an analogy uh let's go back to simple physics one so I have some ball, and it's moving at speed v entirely in the x direction. Let's do x and z here. And we're going to do this near the surface of the Earth, so the force is entirely that way. The force of gravity is that way, so you notice that the force is perpendicular to v, so therefore the magnitude of v, so v can't change. But you know what happens if you work this forward. This V doesn't go in a circle, it goes in a parabola, right? So instantaneously, right here at t equals zero, V doesn't change, but but sometime later, you have V that way, um, and F this way, notice they are no longer perpendicular. And so now the magnitude of V can change because there is a component of gravity, of the force, and therefore the acceleration that is along v so therefore the rate of change of v so that's only instantaneously true so the same thing was true with the um precession right so only if only if you have the force is equal to minus mv squared over r r hat where r hat is uh or yeah r vector is the displacement from the center of the circle to the place where the particle is only if that is true do you get circular motion and that's not true here right because the force is uh first of all the force is not always in the r hat direction it's in the minus z hat direction which won't necessarily always be r hat right and also the magnitude you could tune the magnitude so it's right by picking v um 
but uh, and then pick whatever hell R you want. But anyway, it's obviously it's not going to work. So by the same token, the conclusion we made that the thing was going to move in a circle because the torque was perpendicular to L um, was a rash conclusion, right? So, and in fact, there were two problems with that. Um, one, well, all right, it turns out, well, the torque is always going to be perpendicular to the axis, right? So the, the two problems are, one, this whole thing, does it work out right that it's circular? I don't know. Um, and we argued that it did in the approximation that omega-1 and omega-2 are a lot less than omega-3, right? So most of the angular momentum was it spinning around its own axis. Uh, and I did point out when we were watching this that the precession meant that there was some component of angular momentum along the z-axis, right? You can see the whole thing rotating that way, which is not entirely along the body axis. So omega at that point couldn't be entirely along the body axis. And there's also, remember, angular momentum and uh, angular velocity don't have to be lined up with each other. Right, that's where all of this started, was recognizing that angular momentum and angular velocity aren't necessarily pointing in the same direction. Um, that'll be true uh, even about the center of mass of an object. If you have an object that has different moments of inertia and different principal axes, it's possible for the angular momentum to not be aligned with the angular velocity. But it's especially true in cases like this top, where we're um, rotating around some fixed point instead of around the center of mass. So let's look at some examples of this. All right, so I've got my setup here. Uh, this cylinder is fixed at the origin, so it's free to pivot about the origin without friction, uh, but the bottom of the cylinder is fixed there at the origin. Um, red is X, uh, green is Y, Z is blue, well, okay. Now, in all the analyses we're doing, we treat um, Z as up, Z as the thing that's perpendicular to gravity. Here we have y perpendicular to gravity. That's just because of uh, FizzViz inheriting from V Python, which direction it said was y was up. So you can cope. Um, if you don't like that, you can think of blue as x, red as y, and green as z, and then we're all good. Um, okay, and so then we have the body axes at the top. I don't know if you guys noticed, but in the video I did before with this, I had a left-handed body axis system. Whoops, and that's really important with rotation because... Um, you're doing cross products, and that's when left-handed makes stuff wrong. It turns out that it all worked out. Um, it's just the very first time step was screwed up because of my left-handedness. Whatever, I fixed it here. And then it's going to be rotating at an ungodly rate. Actually, not an ungodly rate. It's going to be rotating 10 times per second. Um, now, which, which is not very fast, right? Let's use your intuition here. What is going to happen if the rotation rate is very small? In fact, let's start with the rotation rate zero, right? It's just going to flop down. In fact, right? That's all it's going to, it's just going to flop down if the rotation rate is zero. So if the rotation rate is very small, it should still just flop down. And look, it does, right? It just flops down and rolls around back the other way. And in fact, at this point, um, if the rotation rate were zero, it's just a physical pendulum. Right. Physical pendulum in contrast to simple pendulum. Simple pendulum has a point mass some distance away. The physical pendulum has mass distributed, whatever. doesn't matter. Anyway, at this point, it, it's just a pendulum if the rotation rate about the vertical axis is zero. Well, the vertical axis, not the vertical axis, the body axis, the body symmetry axis, you could see because it was kind of spazzing out with the um, body axes there that it was rotating. So it wasn't zero, so it's actually not exactly a pendulum. So let's look and see what it does if we let it keep going. So you can see it's oscillating back and forth, but the plane of the oscillation is, is processing, right? The plane that the pendulum's swinging in is processing. That's something you would not have with the pure simple pendulum. So that is the effect of the rotation here is causing the whole thing to process. And it really is the same kind of procession. In fact, this is just excessive nutation, you might describe it as. So, but another way of saying it is just that the plane in which the, oh, we're finished and we got graphs out. The plane in which the, um, uh, the pendulum is swinging is processing is a way of describing that. And 
this might actually remind you of the Foucault pendulum, right? Remember the Foucault pendulum was a case where the plane in which the pendulum was swinging processed, but this is not really the same thing, right? So the Foucault pendulum was just a simple pendulum. It was a, a bob at the end of a long string um, and a simple pen and it wasn't rotating itself. It had no rotation around its own body axis. In fact, a simple pendulum technically can't rotate because it's a point mass. And so there's no moment of inertia, but you know, real pendulums do have some ball that could be rotating, but the Foucault pendulum wasn't, it was not rotating around its own body axis. Um, that was a frame transformation thing because the earth was rotating. Um, and we were looking at it in the rotating frame. So this is different here. We are looking at this in the inertial frame. That's what the, the big axes here are the inertial frame. And the, the thing was processing because of its own rotation. Just one more thing to drive home this whole thing about omega and um, the angular momentum not having to point in the same direction. Um, this big purple vector here is the angular momentum. And you can see at my initial conditions, I've set up my initial conditions. You can barely see the tip arrow of the body symmetry axis, right? That's E3 hat. Um, initial condition is, is it's spinning entirely along that axis. And that is a principal axis. So the initial condition is that the angular momentum is entirely along that axis. The torque right now is perpendicular to that angular momentum. So instantaneously, the magnitude of the angular momentum can't change, but watch it, what happens over time. Whoa! Yes, the magnitude of the angular momentum changes a lot. And the direction changes a lot, right? And it's all over the place, right? So, okay, and that happens, right? Because the torque is not always perpendicular to the angular momentum, so it can change it. And if you think about a simple pendulum, right? The angular momentum magnitude is changing all the time as it swings back and forth. It goes from uh, in, in the out of the page to zero to into the page and out of the page, so on and so forth. Um, all right, and actually, let's go ahead and look at it. So I have 10 million plots here. Actually, it's they're all too small. So let's make this bigger and go ahead and redo the plots and move this so you can see it. Here is the magnitude of angular momentum as a function of time, and you can see that it's making big variations there. Right, so when we worked out the precession before, we made the assumption, and if you go back and you look at the analysis that worked out the precession rate, we made the assumption that omega-1 and omega-2 were a whole lot smaller than omega-3. Um, and obviously, in this case where the pendulum is swinging, that's not always true. In fact, the, the most extreme case is where omega-3 is zero, and you let the pendulum swing, omega-1 or omega-2, depending on which way you started oriented, will go positive and negative, but omega-3 stays zero. So the assumption that omega-1 and omega-2 are very small compared to omega-3 is clearly not true there. Um, and if it's not true, then our precession analysis, you know, if it's not a good approximation, our precession analysis from before doesn't work very well. Um, and so the way Taylor handles that is he goes into the Euler angles. Um, but I want to actually first um, just poke around a little bit and um, use that thing I was just showing you. So that code I was just showing you is actually not the same code as what I showed you before. The code I showed you before um, was under the approximation that omega-1 and omega-2 are very small, in which case we get an analytic expression for omega-1 and omega-2. And I just put that in um, and then got the precession out by looking at how the axes changed. Now, um, what I'm doing in this code is just all I'm doing is solving the full Euler equations. So here on the left, these are the Euler equations uh, for rotation. So that gives you the rate of change of the omegas, although omegas around the body axis, which is always changing, which is awkward. And then on the right, of course, I'm also solving for the rate of change of the unit vectors along the body axis. Um, you know, ideally, I only need to solve for one of these, but because of the way the equations work, I solve for two. So remember, it's I'm solving for more variables than I have freedom, which can be dangerous, but it's working. And I didn't have E1 because E2 cross E3 is just E1. So these all these are the only equations I'm solving, right? It's not that hard. Right, so here's the derives function. Uh, this is the derives function you would use with your Runga cutter or whatever solver that we did this all the time in computational. We've been doing it this semester. Um, all I'm doing is pulling out variables here. And you'll notice all the equations I'm solving are um, the unit vectors. And this is omega cross E is what you get out of that. And then these are the Euler equations here. So it starts without torque, and then I have a torque funk. I call it tau funk here because I usually think of torque as tau, even though Taylor uses capital gamma, uh, but whatever. And then you know I add the torque 
term. And so once you add this to this, you now have the Euler equation. So that's all there is. Um, if you look at the code as a whole, it's really huge. But a lot of that is just doing the visualizations and the plots and all that kind of stuff. Um, right in here, the torque is not very hard either. I have my gravitational forces minus mg in the y direction because of the way the visualization works. And I just cross, so h over 2, that's half the height of the cylinder times e3, the body axis of the cylinder. So that's the vector displacement to the center of mass of the cylinder. Cross that with gravity. And that gives me my torque. And then I can here I convert the torque into the body frame because that's what we need. So um, that's all that I'm solving when I do this. Um, but I'm just doing a full numerical solution of the Euler equations for rotation. No assumptions built in here. This is the full solution. Okay, so what if we let this thing rotate nice and fast so that we're getting closer to the circumstance where omega-3 is a lot bigger than omega-1 and omega-2? Um, initially, of course, omega-3 is uh, positive and omega-1 and omega-2 are both zero. So initially, it's obviously true, but does it stay true? Well, so we'll be closer to that here because... Um, We'll just have it rotating a whole lot faster. So it's going to be rotating at 100 rotations per second. Now, you'd never see that. I'm recording these videos at a frame rate of 25 frames per second. So you wouldn't be able to see that at all. So what I've done is I've slowed time down by a factor of 50. So we should get something like two rotations per second if, if I calculated all of this right. And so, and notice once again, we start with E3 and angular momentum are perfectly aligned. So the angular momentum is along the body axis. So it's rotating entirely around the body axis, but very quickly you see it separates, right? Um, and notice here that E3 is now sagging, right? The body axis sags. It doesn't directly follow around. So when we did the analysis before, when you make the assumption that omega-1 and omega-2 can be ignored, then the angular momentum is entirely along the body. Right? Because um, omega-3 is the only omega that matters, and it's along a principal axis. But in this case, I'm not ignoring omega-1 and omega-2, and you see stuff happens. Now, to see what happens, I'm going to stop this and speed time back up. All right, so this is exactly the same setup as last time, only I will, I'm going to speed it up. So remember, I slowed time down by a factor of 50, so you could see the rotation. Now I'm only slowing time down by a factor of 5. I uh, did that for a couple of reasons. Um, one is so you can just see what's going on. It doesn't move too fast. But actually, also, the real reason is that the integrator can't keep up, at least on my computer. I need a faster computer at home. My computer's too old. Um, on my computer, the integrator can't keep up with real time at this high rate of rotation. It, it has to divide its time step pretty small to get everything right. And, um, and as a result, the whole thing looks very jerky and, and doesn't flow very smoothly. So this whole thing, I have slowed time down by a factor of five, but it's still a factor of 10 faster than before. So we'll watch it go, right? And it's doing what we saw before. I don't have the body axes anymore, but you know, the E3 axis is along and you'll notice uh, it's making this little nutation, right? It's um, oscillating up and down. So that would be the theta Euler angle changing. It's oscillating up and down as it processes around. So that nutation is an additional motion on top of the precession. It comes out of solution to the Euler equations, right? But um, uh, you, you wouldn't, so, so I haven't done anything with Euler angles yet, that's later, but this is something that we wouldn't have seen if we had just done the earlier analysis. And then I, I want to look at a few of these plots here. Uh, right, again, there's too many, so I'm going to make this bigger so that we can zoom in on them and see them. Um, first of all, look, the magnitude of the angular momentum is changing, although not so much. Now, this is a real change. This is not numerical errors. Um, so the magnitude of the angular momentum is changing, but now it's changing by like 1%, um, right? 2 out of 0.2 out of 20 is 1%, right? Now, there are some angular momentums that should be conserved. One of them is LZ is supposed to, sorry, this is L3. The angular momentum along the body axis is supposed to be conserved um, because omega-3 is constant, right? And so um, L3 is just lambda-3 omega-3. Um, is it? Well, yes, because notice all these numbers are plus 20, plus 19.6, 20, and then they're varying in the 10 to the minus 5 place. So again, there's, these are numerical errors you're looking at here, but they're pretty small. Um, the variations of L1 and L, L2, uh, L2 are, of course, huge because as the thing rotates around, um, as, it, the, as the body rotates very quickly, the axes are rotating, and so the 
the directions change. Now, the other one that's supposed to be conserved was LY. Um, again, LZ is the way Taylor talks about it, but um, Y was my vertical axis perpendicular to gravity. So that's supposed to be conserved. It is, although 17 is where we start, and then it's varying in the 10 to the minus 3 place. So it's a very small variation, but you know there is some systematic loss there as a result of the numerical errors. And by the way, one of the things that I did track when I was doing this was, are my unit vectors really staying unit vectors? And by the end of this solution, e1.e1 and e2.e2 were down to 0.994 instead of one. So there's a change going on there. Um, and then the rest of these, uh, you can sit and think about yourself later sometime. Okay, just two more things I want to do here. Um, in all of the previous uh, calculations I did, I set the initial condition so that omega-3 was whatever it was spinning around the body axis, and omega-1 and omega-2 were both zero. Well, now I have set up an omega-1 that's equal to minus omega-3 over 2,000 right? Very small omega one. And um, you can see here that here's the body axis and the, the purple angular momentum vector is not perfectly aligned with the body axis. Um, and it, in fact, it turns out that um, the angular momentum is about 5%. Now, of course, what, what happened to one over 2000 to 5%? Well, remember the um, moment of inertia um, swinging around, say, the x-axis here is way bigger than the moment of inertia going around the z-axis. And so that's why omega was so small, but the angular momentum proportionately is more like a tangent of 1 20th or something like that. So anyway, so this time I gave it an, an initial omega 1. And why? Well, just because I wanted to do this. And watch as it goes. It makes little curly cues. Isn't that pretty? Right. So before all the nutation we were seeing, it was sort of bouncing up and down. But now the nutation is making curly cues. It's kind of interesting how the thing sort of rolls around the angular momentum vector as it goes. Right. So that's another thing, just depending on exactly how the thing is rotating when you first set it up. So in this case, I had I had the same omega three as before, but I gave it an initial omega one. It caused this thing to go in curly cues like this. Finally, you might ask the question, is there a rotation rate you can set up such that it doesn't nutate at all? And there is, and you maybe can figure this out from the reading. What you should do is go look at the plot of U effective versus theta in the Euler angle reading. Notice U effective um, versus theta has a minimum, which means it has an equilibrium point, which means if you start at that theta, um, it should stay at that theta. Remember, theta is the angle off of the vertical axis, that angle there. And so if that theta is constant, then it should be processing without nutating. And so what you can do is use that. Just take du d theta, figure out what uh, theta you need. Well, it's not what theta you need. Given what theta you have, what L3 and Lz you need. And so I chose my L3. What Lz do I need? That's going to determine what um, L1 is. So I picked my omega-1, and you'll notice that my omega-1 in this case moves the angular momentum in the opposite direction. And when I start the thing going, notice it's not bobbing up and down anymore. So it's spinning. It's still spinning. At the, the omega-3 is still 100 oscillations per second. And I've still slowed time down by a factor of 5 um, so that we can see what's going and so that the computer can keep up. Um, but you can see that. So this thing is spinning really fast. <laughs> Um, and it's processing, nicely processing, no nutation at all. But that's because I very carefully chose my initial omegas, the omega-1 and the omega-3, to make it right. And let's see why as it gets close to here, boom, it lines perfectly back up. So it's not just a really slow nutation. It really is no nutation. And the thing goes around in a circle like that. And actually, it turns out there are two sets of initial conditions. So for a given omega-3, there are two different omega-1s that give you a uh, no nutation precession. Mathematically, it comes out because there was a squared, and so you had a plus or minus square root in there. And you're looking at this, and you're thinking, what the heck is he doing? Look how far off the angular momentum vector is from that. So omega-1 is, is appreciable here. In fact, um, the angular momentum um, along the E1 axis, which is that way, is about half the angular momentum it's spinning around. So um, this is 
it's maybe not really right to say it's spinning around its body axis, but they're lined up perfectly. So when it goes, notice, and notice it goes around really fast. Remember, this is slowed down by a factor of five. It makes nice little circles again. And so, yes, here's another spin rate where I can get precession without nutation. All right, so that's all I want to say about that for now. I will put this code online. I'll put some of the graphs online as well that I showed you so you can go and look at all the various plots um, and, and think about them and say, does this make any sense whatsoever? Um, the point of all this was, you know, what is notation, notation? What does it look like? Well, it shows up if you just numerically solve the Euler equations for the rotation of a solid body. Uh, but then you can also get nutation out of looking at the Euler angles and then coming up with equations, differential equations for the Euler angles as a function of time. And so we will do that next, but that's for another video. All right, so we need to set the record straight a little bit. So this is Butter. Hello, Butter. So for comparison, here's my hand. Yes, Butter. And Butter is actually not a chonk, but it's very lightweight. She's a very small kitty. She looks bigger than she is because she's fluffy. Yes, and she's purring. She's a nice kitty. So that's Butter. And this is Novella. Novella is a chonk. We like to say that Novella's thick. No, Novella, you want to be on film, don't you? Wish well, she's thick. Come here, kitty. Yes, kitty. Here's my hand for comparison. And because she has this thick fur. Yes, kitten. Yes, Novella. Here, look at the camera. Yes, sweet kitty. Yes, you don't have to be nervous. Yes, you want to bite me? No? No? Okay. Yes, she's a nice kitty. Yes, kitten.